there are sometimes when I ask some authors to write a foreword to my book. And there's a problem if that person who writes the foreword is much better author than me, then people find my book a disappointment. So I think that's what happened with the introduction now. <laughs> I hope the talk will not be too much of anticlimax. After that kind of introduction, I don't think anybody can survive. So I'll be speaking today on the topic of <coughs> avoiding violence in speech or we could say non-violence in speech. And uh, there are quite a few occasions in my life when I have wished that I was not so articulate. Most people feel that they can't express themselves clearly, but nothing in life is a pure blessing. Because I am an author, I tend to be good at words. But then when I get angry with someone and then if I criticize them, I can cut them with such precise words that can cause lifelong wounds. Some people when they get angry, we can see they are angry, but we can't make out what they are saying. They become incoherent. But some people they become angry and they can cut very severely also. So our tongue is like a sword that is always with us, inside us. Or to give a more contemporary example, our tongue is like a loaded gun that we are always carrying with us. Now there is quite nowadays there is concern that many people have these assault vehicles, assault uh, weapons, not vehicles, which they can just use to do school shootings or other place things like that. Now most of us would not do physical violence, but verbal violence can easily happen and it does happen. So it's important for us to recognize that the tongue can cut and it can cut very badly. The uh, sticks cannot sticks can only break bones, but tongues can break hearts. And if we imagine if we had a gun with us, we would recognize that I have to be extremely responsible. I cannot just let this gun get fired accidentally. So similarly, we understand we, we have a gun right here inside our mouth. And how we use it will determine not only our future, but the future of those around us also. We can break people's hearts. And of course, they will reciprocate by breaking our hearts. Then. So I'll talk about non-violence in speech. And this is the Bhagavad Gita 17.15 and 16 I'll be using. So 15 talks about austerity of speech and 16 talks about austerity of the mind. It's 16 over there. It should actually be 15. But I'll mention a little bit from 16 also when I talk about it. So this verse 17.15 is Anudvega karam vakyam satyam priyahitam chayat swadhyaya bhyasanam chayva vanmayam tapa uchyate So I talked about the tongue being like a sword or a gun. So Krishna says how to discipline your speech. If somebody has a gun, how to make sure it doesn't fire accidentally. So broadly, Krishna is talking about five attributes of disciplined speech. So out of those four are, it should be non-agitating. Anudvega, karam, satya, be truthful. Priyam, be pleasing. Hitam, be beneficial. And lastly, he says, Swadhyaya, besinam, chaiva. Repeat scripture. Speak according to scripture and just recite scripture regularly. That is also an austerity of speech. So I am focusing on the first four attributes over here and I have divided those four attributes into two broad categories. You can see, so if our speech is to be effective, then it has to be both sensitive and sensible. Sensible means what we see should make sense, it should have meaning in it. And sensitive means we need to be aware of people's emotions and make sure that it doesn't unnecessarily hurt them. And so those four attributes are divided under these two categories. Sensitive means non-agitating and pleasing. We understand people's emotional state and speak in a way that pleases the other person, doesn't unnecessarily hurt the other person. Quite often when we get angry, we want to be 
we just blurt out now we should we should speak to give others peace of mind but most often we speak to give others a piece of our mind <laughs> and often it's a bad piece of our mind <laughs> so speak to give peace of mind not a piece of your mind so it should be non agitating and pleasing is about being sensitive and the other two aspects are it, we don't want to be flatterers so we have to speak the truth so that part, it should be sensible so it should be truthful and it should be beneficial what we speak should be of some use to others some people speak to express their thoughts and some people speak to discover their thoughts <laughs> they speak hey i didn't mean to say that <laughs> it's like a slip of tongue so there has to be some thought before speaking so sensible and sensitive now in both these directions our topic is broadly non violence in speech so violence in speech can happen in both ways if there is only sensitivity and no sense in it and if there is only sense and no sensitivity in it so that is going to be the broadly the remaining part of the class so how to balance these two so effective speech is sensitive and sensible and that if you could go towards one extreme where we are sensitive but we are not sensible at all so we care so much for people's emotions that we don't care what we are, whether we are speaking the right thing or not so the example for that could be that if a child has some infection injurious disease and the child needs an injection and they go to a doctor and the doctor says okay now i have to give an injection the child says no 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 it causes me so much pain i don't want injection and the child says protesting and crying and says you know you are such a cruel person i came to be healed but you are causing me more pain now and the doctor starts thinking oh you know i shouldn't cause pain to the child and doctor doesn't give the injection what will happen what do you think will happen child will become more sick isn't it so the they may think that i am being kind but actually the doctor is being unkind so there are times when the truth has to be spoken but if it is and if it is not spoken just because it is going to hurt the other person then we are being sensitive at the cost of being sensible so that is a extreme which is unhealthy so here what happens when we are sensitive at the cost of being sensible we are caring for others feelings but not their future oh i don't want the child to feel pain that's true but the child is going to feel bigger pain in future if i don't have give the injection to the child so we if we care too much for people's feelings and not for their futures that is where we go to the extreme of being sensitive without being sensible and then we can go toward violence in that direction because that person is hurting and is doing something which is going to hurt them further if it's our duty to stop them and if we don't stop them we are doing violence shila bhakti siddhant sarasvati thakur the spiritual master of shila prabhupad would give the example that if somebody is walking on a tall building with no parapet walls and they're walking toward the edge and they're going to walk off the edge so then you know yell and tell them don't walk over there and if you don't tell them that then we are unwittingly being violent so if that child, that person just enjoying the scenery watching everywhere and not looking ahead and we yell at him stop and that person says hey, why are you disturbing me such a beautiful scenery let me watch it stop look down you are just inter interrupting with my enjoyment no but your enjoyment is going to lead to destruction so that is one extreme and the other extreme could be where uh, I'll, i'll come to this a little later again in the class but this is a overview of what i'm going to do so let's look at the other extreme is we are sensible but without being sensitive so there we want to do the right thing we want to speak the right thing but we don't care at all for how what we are doing is going to impact the other person suppose a person needs to be operated and 
uh, the, the, the doctor, the surgeon has come and the surgeon doesn't give anesthesia. And then they are operated. It will be excruciatingly painful. And if the doctor has the opportunity to give anesthesia but the doctor doesn't give the anesthesia, then that will be violence on the part of the doctor. So the doctor when doing surgery has to cause pain. But the pain should be minimum, as less as possible. And one way to lessen the pain is by giving anesthesia. So anesthesia in this case is like sensitivity, caring for people's feelings. So sometimes we may care so much for people's future. Now if you do this, this is going to be wrong. And this is going to be terrible for you. We may be genuinely concerned about their future, but we may not care for their present feelings at all. Like sometimes we may we may find we may in order to caution someone, maybe if we have a teenage child or somebody else, like that, we may find uh, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So what happens? Then people sometimes start feeling that you always you only find faults with me. The only thing you find is fault. Whatever I do, it can never please you. So we may have appreciation in our heart for them, but when we speak, we usually catch them when they are doing something wrong. And then they become alienated by that. When they become alienated, then if we speak, even if we speak the truth, even if it is beneficial, but still it won't benefit them. Because we won't get their cooperation. Or we will have at least very active rebellion on our hands. So we can't only care for the future and we can't care only for the feelings. There has to be a balance of both. That's how we can make sure that our speech doesn't become violent but stays effective. So I will divide this talk into three parts. This was the first part about the overview of what I'm going to speak. Any comments or questions till now? Any any point? Yes. Um, we're going to keep you on that way a little bit. Or towards the ready? Will I get the mic? <laughs> or continue to. Is it on? It's on. Okay. Is it? Mm. You can speak. I'll repeat. Okay. Um, wonder if you can elaborate or continue with that same sense of sensibility of how it's easy as a spiritual practitioner um, if you're trying to follow a philosophy or, you know, I've seen this in so many different circles, to use philosophy in, and it's sensible in a very insensitive way. Like you use the example of a doctor. So people can so much take things out of context and really be very insensible, but at the same time, we don't want to be sentimental. Um, yeah, it's, it's very really, it's, It feels like a very real thing that happens in a lot of spiritual traditions and teachings. Exactly. Yeah. On that yeah. By that Thank you. It's a very important concern. And actually, the later part of the seminar is this itself. Yeah, because often our spirituality makes us more judgmental about others than more understanding about others. So once we have spiritual knowledge, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is deviant, this is sinful, this is like this, this is like that. And then when we start becoming dismissive, then it can alienate people. I was at an interfaith conference and there, there was a Christian pastor. He told me that they had done some survey about, about what are young people's perception about religious people, about pastors. So there was, there was one, sir, one young boy, he said that a pastor, a priest or a pastor or a religious teacher is someone who is always worried that someone somewhere is having some fun. <laughs> so, some people feel that you just impose your standards, your rules on everyone else and you, you just take the joy out of my life. So yes, we can be judgmental at times and we have to be cautious about that. Uh, so going back to the surgery, I'll elaborate on the surgery example elab uh, in due course. Thank you for this point. It's, so now, so now let, first I'll talk about this part, 
sensitive but not sensible and then I'll go to sensible but not sensitive. So in that sensible not but sensitive I'll come to your part. So this sensitive but not sensible is very common nowadays in the form of political correctness. And yes, sometimes political correctness can express sensitivity. But you can take it to great extremes. Where it's like your freedom ends where my feelings begin. Your freedom of speech ends where my feelings begin. And where my feelings begin, I will decide that. So it's, you can, if sometimes political correctness is taken too much extreme, so what is it? Moral posturing about being sensitive at the expense of being sensible. It's not even being sensitive, it's being moral posturing. You know, I am, see, I am so sensitive and you also have to be sensitive. So when, when we have this at an extreme, then there is a lot of problem that comes up because you know, people just can't function normally. Who is going to be like a thought police or a speech police? You say, this cannot be spoken. This cannot be spoken. Yes, there has to. See, there are certain things which are wrong, but not everything wrong can be made illegal. There is individual autonomy and individual responsibility, and some people are just uncouth in their speaking. And it would be nice if they would be cultured, but we cannot go to the extreme that anybody says any feelings are wrong, and you can't speak this. The result of this would be that we cannot have freedom of speech. We cannot have freedom of expression. So political correctness is good to the extent we are aware and conscious that certain people have been disenfranchised in the past. They have suffered in the past. And we don't want to use derogatory labels against people. But that doesn't mean that we become hypersensitive about it. So that is, uh, now when sensitivity becomes too important for people, this can happen even in the area of religion and spirituality where there can be absolute relativism. See, we, need, we all need to be open-minded. But we can't be so open-minded that our brain falls out. <laughs> what does that mean? Once Srila Prabhupada was giving a talk on the Bhagavad Gita and after that one person asked a question, Swamiji, I don't know which is the verse in the Gita but I know Krishna has said that whichever path you follow, you will come to me. And Prabhupada replied, if that were the case, then why does Krishna have to speak the Bhagavad Gita? <laughs> if whatever you do, you are going to come to Krishna, why does Krishna have to speak the Bhagavad Gita? The Bhagavad Gita is spoken to outline some parts. Arjuna has a very specific question. I want to know what is Dharma. So to say that all parts are right, you cannot, there are different people who have different ideas and different paths. We don't want to personally attack anyone. But we need to evaluate the merits of different paths. So that we can choose a particular path and commit to that path. Most of the times people who say that all paths are equal. Now they have equal commitment to all paths. And that is zero. <laughs> Those who say all paths are equal, what happens? They end up not following any path. Now, what do, what do I mean by all paths are not equal? So it's, it's like if somebody says that all paths are equal, so I am an atheist, you are a theist, both are equal. Well, if both are equal, they are contradictory. Now, this doesn't mean atheists should be persecuted, but we have to evaluate based on merit. Now, there's another extreme, you could say only my path is the right path. That is also extremism. There can be different right paths. But we have to evaluate based on merit. Going back to the sick person's example, there can be different kinds of therapies. There can be allopathy, there can be Ayurveda, there can be naturopathy, there can be homeopathy. But there are some broad parameters. This is a sick condition and by following this therapy you should become healthy. If you say all treatments are right and don't even evaluate whether a person is becoming healthy or not. Well, that's not right. So, if we go towards extreme political correctness, 
then the whole idea of truth and false can get completely lost. So this is where if we are sensitive at the expense of being sensible. Now let's go to the other, other part that somebody might be sensible at the cost of being sensitive. So if somebody is completely logically correct and that is all they are at, then what happens even if we are right and even if we tell that tell that we are right but it's not that look, we can look at our own lives how many times that as soon as we know something is right we do it there's so many things which we know we are right but we are struggling to do it so we need to not just be instructed but inspired and speech it doesn't serve its full purpose unless it also encourages, it also inspires. And the Bhagavad Gita itself is this dynamic that throughout the Gita repeatedly Krishna is empathic, Krishna is encouraging, Krishna is inspiring. Arjun, he tells in 6.34 and 35 that 33 and 34 that the mind is very difficult to control. Chanchalam Himanha Krishna Pramathi balavadridham tasyaham nigraham manye vayo rivasudushkaram. So he says the mind is restless, reasonless, relentless, and just can't control the mind. So then uh, what does Krishna say? Krishna doesn't say just buck up, don't be lazy, control it. Krishna says, Asam shayam mahabaho manodur nigraham chalam. Yes, undoubtedly, it is difficult to control the mind. So Krishna empathizes with Arjuna. It's only when Arjuna feels understood that Arjuna becomes ready to understand. Suppose we are sick and we go to a doctor. And as soon as we sit on the doctor's chair, the doctor starts giving a prescription. Hey, I didn't even tell my symptoms. No, I already know the symptoms. Just take the prescription. Even if the doctor were giving the right prescription, unless we had the confidence that the doctor has understood me, we would not feel confident about taking the prescription. Isn't it? So, people need to feel understood before they become ready to understand. And that's, that's where sensitivity comes into the picture. So, I might be log the doctor might be logically right. This is your disease. I can see the symptoms. I have seen so many people with this disease. Just by looking at it, I know what the problem is. And I'll give the treatment. But no. So if we are simply logically correct, we might instruct others, but we may not inspire others. We won't inspire confidence. We won't inspire commitment. That's why it says only sense, sensible sense without sensitivity. That doesn't work. And more often than not, on the spiritual path, if we are practicing if we are practicing some spiritual path and we are trying to share that with others, we can go in that direction. So, one common metaphor that is used in spiritual circles is that those who are saintly, their words are like swords, they cut. So, it's, a, it's like a, you could say it's like a surgical scalpel, scalpel, which cuts. What do they cut? The words of saintly people cut are illusions. And there are so many examples of this in the Bhagavatam. Dhritarashtra is very attached. Dhritarashtra is an excellent example of very strong attachment. Now, there, are, there are bad examples and there are good bad examples. <laughs> what do you mean good bad examples? That bad examples can also be of different categories. Some examples may be good. So Dhritarashtra had to lose everything before he lost his attachment. To lose everything and then he became ready. So Vidura's words came and Vidura spoke to him. What are you doing staying in your kingdom like this? doing nothing except producing cuff. He said, now it's time for you to renounce the word. And his strong words had an effect. So sometimes attachments and misconceptions need to be cut. And though that cutting of attachments and misconceptions is like a surgery. So it needs to be done at times if people are to grow in their understanding. At the same time, when we do, so that, that's where, as per, when we're sharing spiritual knowledge, it's our responsibility to communicate in a way that 
others mm. misconceptions and illusions can be removed but surgery has to be done very carefully and we become judgmental and we alienate people when we don't consider the context while doing surgery so there are four broad qualify qualifying conditions before surgery can be done now surgery is first of all never done without consent that persons or at least some relative or somebody of that you cannot do surgery without consent one of my friends is a surgeon and uh, he had invited me to his he, we were discussing something and he invited me to his place so i was in the just i was going to the he was going to do surgery and just before that the patient said i don't know i have been asked to sign the statement that there is this because of this the surgery is risky and i know the risk and i i said i'm not going to sign this you must assure me that uh, i'll be safe i said doctor said i will do my best to make sure the surgery goes safely but there's danger just, nobody can guarantee complete safety right now we are sitting nobody can guarantee that the roof is not going to cave on us it won't very very low probability but he said that they, so then the patient said no no I, i don't accept this you have to guarantee that i am safe i am safe then the doctor said then we cannot do the surgery so without consent surgery cannot be done so similarly unless people accept us as some kind of spiritual authority if we try to challenge and correct their misconceptions we are simply overstepping it's like a doctor doing surgery without consent and actually this is a bigger problem because at least when a patient comes to a doctor they know they are sick most people don't know they are sick most people think everything is fine in my life so because of that unless a person is ready to accept us as a spiritual authority at some level without that we cannot really cut people's misconceptions so the first thing we need to do is just connect with people at a human level when prabhupada was asked how do we know your followers prabhupada said that they are perfect ladies and gentlemen that means we connect with people at a human level by being gentlemen by being cultured and once we connect with people at a human level then we can connect with them at a spiritual level so consent means we earn people's trust at the very basic level if we are going to correct anybody's misconceptions if we are going to elevate somebody to a higher understanding they need to have that faith that we are their well wishers and earning that faith is a responsibility of any spiritual teacher or anybody who wants to share spiritual knowledge and secondly that that is apart from consent generally surgery is never the first line of treatment it normally other treatments are tried and other treatments don't work normally non surgical intervention is tried if it doesn't work then you go towards surgery imagine somebody comes into the hospital and doctor starts the surgery hey, what is this so like that sometimes somebody just comes first time to a temple first time to a spiritual program first time to meet a devotee and what happens we just start downloading everything on them <laughs> i remember um, about 20 25 years ago i was just uh, i had just been introduced to krishna consciousness and i had the what is called the zeal of the new convert so i was i was working in a company at that time software and software company so the bus would take us and during the while well, try to about one hour ride so during the ride i i used to usually read some books or hear some talks or write something so then one day a colleague who had been a who had also been a co student with me in my college we were both, both working in the same company he made the mistake of asking me what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> and then for the next one hour I gave him a crash course in the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> All the concepts, right from existence of God, existence of soul, karma, four regulative principles, everything, and I was congratulating myself. Wow! In one hour, I've given everything. And his eyes were becoming dizzy, and I just didn't notice it. 
and after that whenever no, normally I, I, my, my stop was first so I would get to the first bus first and then his stop would come and he would get to the bus so after that when every day when he would climb the bus he would first peek into the door <laughs> <laughs> see where I am sitting and then come from the other door <laughs> so after many years now he is in Seattle so I met him in Seattle and we both talked about it I had a good laugh so what happened is that I wanted to speak something, I thought I am benefiting him, but I just gave him such an overdose, I tried to perform the whole surgery, removing all his misconceptions in one session. And it was just a casual inquiry, what are you doing? So after that, for I was working for several months in that company, and I would go for the, go, go for, nobody ever made that mistake of asking me, what are you doing? <laughs> so this is, this is, we all learn from our mistakes. So non-surgical intervention, is where is where we gradually develop a relationship not that we directly attack people's misconceptions and then the third point is that when surgery is done an anesthesia has to be given first without anesthesia we should not give to surgery and what is the anesthesia the anesthesia in this case is a loving relationship Without a loving relationship, people can't take harsh words. Even in a loving relationship also, it's difficult to take harsh words. To, to be shown that we are wrong about something is not easy to accept. But at least if the person feels that yeah, I have a relationship, I have this person is a good person, I like this person, I have a relationship with them. Then within that context, the the words which challenge somebody's misconceptions when they are spoken, then they can have a desirable effect. So broadly speaking, we need to invest in others. In, and then whenever we are going to tell people that something that they are doing is wrong, that's like a withdrawal. And if you withdraw more than what we have invested, then the relationship becomes bankrupt. So uh, the developing a relationship with people is very important. Then that is, that is basically, it decreases the pain of any strong word that are spoken. And lastly is when surgery is done, after the surgery also, pain medication is given. So similarly, when we speak something which is, which somebody is doing something wrong and we need to correct them for doing something wrong, we correct it. But even when we correct, we need to assure them that we still value them, that we still respect them. So it is, say I am here, the other person is here. So what we are doing is, we have to make sure that we are telling them that I value you, it is only this particular action, this particular attitude, this particular thought, thinky thought process, that is what I have concern with. So when we are able to separate that, what happens is sometimes when we criticize, we equate the person with their problematic behavior. And then we condemn the person themselves entirely. When somebody feels attacked, then it's very difficult to tolerate. It's like say, you know, if our hair are cut, there's hardly any pain. But while cutting the hair, say while shaving, if we cut the skin, there's much more pain. But sometimes while shaving, we don't just cut the skin, if we cut a nerve far greater pain. So the closer we cut to the nerve, the greater is the pain. So similarly, our words, when we are going to cut, the closer we cut to a nerve, the greater is the pain the other person is going to feel. So when we are going to cut, we have to be very careful that we, we are cutting people's misconceptions, not their aspirations. Their, their aspiration, okay, I want to learn something about spirituality, I want to grow into a better human being, a better person. Those aspirations, if we cut by our words, then they will just stay where they are. They will become disheartened. So we need to be very careful that we cut what needs to be cut, not what needs to be nourished. Like when we are cutting, we need to, even if we have a garden, we need to cut the weeds, not the, not the, plants that we want to cultivate and grow. So it has to be very, so the pain medication means it's very clear that we accept the other person, we value the other person. It is only this particular issue that we have concern about. 
and the peep sometimes what happens is we we hand out labels very easily this person is a materialist this person is a mayavadi this person is a atheist we have to treat people as conscious beings not as philosophical categories <laughs> people are not philosophical categories people are conscious beings and for most people their philosophy whatever it may be it's just a small part of their life and rather than becoming uh, rather than condemning it we need to encourage them to move forward a simple example to illustrate this and then i'll conclude that say suppose somebody is following some path which we with our philosophical understanding know is wrong but today people live, live with such agitated minds in such agitated world that anything it gives them a little experience of peace some little sattva guna some little high something higher they feel some relief so say imagine somebody is out in the cold in the winter over here and they have a thin torn tattered blanket and we tell them this blanket so useless can you see how thin it is can you see how torn it is just throw it away now our intent might be to i'll give you a thick comfortable blanket but they have not seen that blanket now the only relief they have experienced is through the thin cloth that they have if we tell them throw away that cloth i'll give you a better cloth they will not be ready what we need to do is first give them the thick blanket let them ex themselves experience the comfort of that blanket and once they experience that comfort they will themselves give up that thin blanket similarly for us whatever path people are following they have experienced something it might be a very minor relief from life's distresses but they've experienced something that's why they're holding on to it that is the only thing that is giving them some relief from the world's agitations so instead of telling them to give it up we focus first on giving them an experience of krishna <coughs> invite them for some kirtans invite them for some temples invite them, give them some prasad let them get an experience of krishna so rather than giving education about krishna first we give them experience of krishna of course education is important but ultimately the education is meant to culminate in experience so if people experience relief peace and joy in becoming conscious of krishna then whatever other misconceptions they have gradually they'll start they will themselves give it up so that's why this understanding an incremental approach focus more on giving rather than making people leave something often when people have certain misconceptions their misconceptions don't obstruct them in their spiritual journey as our telling that those are misconceptions even with their misconception they can still come to krishna they can still experience krishna and gradually they'll give up those misconceptions so that brings me to the last point now the same point about what he said he said to speak the truth but speak it in such a way that attracts people to the truth not alienates them from the truth when we inspire people to practice bhakti the ultimate purpose of bhakti is yad gatvan anivartante tad dham paramam mama when we practice bhakti we go to krishna's eternal abode and never to come back but sometimes we present bhakti to people in such a way that yad gatvan anivartante they never come to the temple again <laughs> so if we alienate people by how we speak then we are doing violence those of us who have been in bhakti for some time sometimes some preachers or speakers they become a little proud they say i brought so many people to krishna this person became a devotee because of me this person became a devotee because of me yeah we might make a count like that but you know, there is no count of how many people did not come to krishna because of us <laughs> how many people we may have driven out because driven away because of the way we conducted ourselves and i can say that there at least in the early years of my spiritual life i did so much verbal violence so i'm slowly learning and this reflection along with i seek the good wishes of all of you that i can also use this gun which is already there inside this pistol which is already there 
learn to use it more carefully. So I'll quickly summarize. I spoke today on the topic of becoming non-violence in speech. I talked about Krishna author austerity of speech. It divided that in two categories, being sensitive and being sensible. So truthful and beneficial, at the same time non-agitating and pleasing. And so effective speech has to be a balance of sensitivity and sensibility. If you are only sensitive and not sensible, then what happens? We become like a doctor who doesn't give injection because just because the child is protesting. We care for people's feelings so much that we don't care for their future. On the other hand, if we are only sensible but not sensitive, then we are like a doctor who does a surgery without giving anesthesia. We care only for the future but not the feelings of people. So to have a balance between the two is the art of effective speaking. We all have a sword or a gun inside us in our mouth. And if we don't use it properly, we can hurt people enormously. So then I talk about political correctness. In an extreme way, what happens? It means simply we are so sensitive that we never speak the truth. In fact, we abandon the idea of truth itself. To so say that all paths are right in an uncritical way, is to be so open-minded as to let your brain fall out. We cannot uh, go to that extreme of political correctness. We need to be sensitive, but we also need to be sensible. Another extreme, which is quite likely, is that we are so sensible that we are not sensitive at all. But that happens when if somebody uh, we logically present something, but we don't inspire us. Doctor may give the right prescription, but when the patient doesn't feel understood, then the patient may not take the prescription. So we need to not only instruct but inspire and to do that we need to connect with people at a human level. The, the words of those with spiritual knowledge can act like surgical scalp, scalpels. They can cut off misconceptions but we cannot presume that. We should not become judgmental with others and we need to have consent. I talked about four points. That before surgery is done consent has to be given. People should accept us as some kind of spiritual authority or at least their well-wishers and then non-surgical intervention. We can try in more sensitive, you can try with normal ways to help people grow without necessarily challenging their misconceptions and an anesthesia has to be given. People need to be in a trusting relationship before they can hear strong words in that relationship. And lastly, we have to give pain medication. That means we separate people's problematic attitudes or conceptions or behaviors from the person and we accept and value the person why challenging their uh, problematic side? So if we cut too close to the nerve, the pain can become unbearable. So we need to separate so that we can show people that we are not cutting you, I am cutting something which is separate from you. So we need to, uh, so I talked about how, rather than telling people what is wrong, give them the experience of what is right. Rather than pulling away the torn, blind, a torn sheet that they have, give them a thick comforter. More important than educating people about Krishna is helping people get an experience of Krishna. We need to speak the truth in a way that attracts people to the truth and doesn't alienate them. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Do you have a few minutes? Yeah. Okay. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, microphone. to control emotion when we're trying to speak effectively or even how to respond to somebody who's speaking with a lot of emotion. Um, how do we control that? <laughs> even sometimes just too excited or angry or just any emotion that might affect my speech. Yeah. How do we, the two separate questions, if somebody is very angry, somebody is very emotional, how, what do we do at that time? It's very difficult because we tend to be reactive. So if somebody speaks, uh, speaks in a way that is very annoying or very irritating. So rather than taking it personally, when people hurt us, most often it is they who are hurt. So every, every judgmental expression is actually a distorted expression of an unmet need. So if somebody says, 
recently somebody told me, you know, you have no emotions. I just got so angry. He said, how dare you say that? I had been trying to be very sensitive with that person. But then it struck me that, okay, that means whatever support I was giving, that is not enough for that person. So then, if I say, how dare you call me? You have no emotions like that. So if I, I, I look at it simply like, uh, simply like uh, uh, attack on me, then what will happen is I'll respond to the attack and the real issue will be lost. So it does. So if somebody is hurting us, rather than taking that hurt personally, we understand they are hurting. They have some need which is not met. Need which is not met. Met, and we try to see if we can meet that need. Now it's not always possible for us to meet, but one thing is when most of the times when people criticize us, it is not about us. Only a small part may be about us. It's everybody has a movie going on inside their head and in that movie they are the stars and we are the extras <laughs> so what happens even if they are they are hitting out at us if we understand that it, it's it's not it could be about me but it's not necessarily about me so then we can try to say okay if when would I speak something like this if I said to, said to someone you have no emotions Obviously, I would speak like that when I felt that that person had been very insensitive to me, when I had not met that person's emotional needs. So instead of taking that attack personally, we try to understand what is their need. And one way to do it is just to ask ourselves, when would I speak something like this? Of course, we could be very different from them and we might not get a clear idea by that, but at least we'll get an indication. So that is one thing. Uh, in, you know, all of us, we may be adults, but there is like an infant still inside us. And say, you know, there's a mother and she picks up the baby and the baby kicks the mother. Now, the kick will hurt, but the mother doesn't take that personally. The baby is not even aware, the baby is maybe, maybe hungry, thirsty, whatever it is. You know, so like that, sometimes people, even if they may be adults, inside them there is like a flailing infant. And when they hurt us, it's often not about us. So if we can understand that and create a little bit distance, then we can respond a little better. It's easy to speak this, it's difficult, but in general, if we have got some emotional security ourselves, then we can not, we can, we won't take their attack personally. That's why through our spirituality, through our other relationships, through our inner growth, if we have that inner security, then we, that becomes like a buffer for us. See, if we are very weak, somebody hits us, physically also, it will injure us. But if some people have a tough physique. Even if somebody hits them, it doesn't hurt them so much. So like that, we all need to, we, in spiritual life, in Divakti, we all want a tender heart. But we need to cover this tender heart with a thick skin. And if you have tender skin, then we will be tormented and we will torment others. Okay, does that answer your question? Thank you. Anyway, we have time for one more question. Someone truly has one question. Someone, you have a question? She has the same question that, you know, when you are angry at times, okay. it's kind of difficult to control yourself. Okay, this is. But someone never gets angry, so. <laughs> One more question is that, is that true that women remember things more when you say something? <laughs> she said something in 1970 about her brother that he's not very intelligent in 19, mm. you know, 2019 she still remembers it. <laughs> I don't remember the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is it that women remember more? See, all of us have certain, we could say all of us have certain emotional currency. And we all have different emotional currencies. So if I buy something from a shop and it's worth $50 and I give them 10,000 Indian rupees and say that person has never been to India, that person has never seen INR, then they'll say, what? You're not giving me anything. I said, I've given you so much. So what happens basically 
if uh, if two people are in a relationship but both of them are trading in two different currencies so what happens each person feels i am doing so much for you but the other person feels you are doing nothing for me and i am doing so much for you so then what do i mean by currency so different people value different things so some people value time for them if you just spend time talking with them they're so grateful for some people it's not so much spending time you do something you know, i have to do that you do this do this do this do the dishes or take this out do that get that buy that remember doing the practical acts of service for some people it's that you know you should appreciate so what happens for different people there can be different currencies in which they are trading in their emotions like a like a father might get very expensive cricket bat and cricket ball for the child for their son the son doesn't want the expensive bat and ball the son wants the father to play with him the father says you know i am working so hard for all to get all this for you i don't have time to play with you and the father may feel i have done so much for my child and the child may say my father never loved me so if it is happening that somebody is remembering something from a very long time ago now what does that mean that simply means that that is the currency in which they are trading so in general how do we know which currency people are trading in broadly by two ways one is what is it if we do they appreciate very much and the other is what is it if we don't do they complain on and on and on and on so if they are remembering something like that then that means that is the currency in which they are trading and that's why they are that's why that's why they are remembering it otherwise life is so complicated who has time to remember even things that happened yesterday if we are remembering something then that means it's important for us and we can't tell people don't take it seriously it's not important if that is important for them then we also have to give it importance so rather than making it like a a judgmental statement that you are you are digging old things from the past or you are making small things big we need to understand that in their emotional currency this thing is big so therefore in future i need to pay attention to that okay thank you thank you so much to the time chairman for who we're so grateful uh, that you're here And fortunately, you, like I, you saw what I was saying.